Efficiency. Learning new skills in the shortest amount of time possible. That's the core of today's discussion. Gaming intelligently. Let's dive right in. There's a myriad of ways to start gaming intelligently, so let's hit some of the basic ideas, then dive into some of the specifics on each of these core concepts. Number one, using your gaming time intelligently with deliberate practice in areas like aim, movements, and map knowledge are critical to your success in any video game. Number two, limiting your game time to four days a week can make the psychological process of learning a lot easier. Number three, Keep your gaming sessions reasonable in length, and take breaks to keep a fresh head and increase your chances of getting in the zone. And finally, we'll talk about setting the stage for flow states by building your skill, setting goals, and creating a mental reset button. Special thanks, by the way, to Andrew Kinch of GameAware for helping in the creation of this video. You can check out his website along with both some breakout articles and some of the inspiration for this video in the link in the description box down below. First, let's talk about deliberate practice. If there is a specific part of your gameplay that you're looking to improve, you quite simply have to practice that specific thing. A pitcher in baseball never got good at mastering the different pitches he'd like to throw by swinging a bat. A swimmer never improved his lung capacity by doing extra glute stretches. Do you get the point here? In the context of a complex game like Titanfall 2, you're never going to get better at aiming without practicing your aiming. You're never going to improve at parkour and moving quickly without putting in lots of time and effort in private match. If you spend the time and you practice with a deliberate goal as part of your gaming time, you're going to see results when you enter a real match. The payoff is absolutely worth it because you improve much more quickly than if you were just to play day in and day out with no designed purpose. Here's a personal example. Early on in Titanfall 2's lifetime, I felt like I was having difficulty performing good wall hops, which are a difficult technique that allows you to accelerate your pilot, which is the character that you play as, to absurd speeds. So I went into the Pilot Gauntlet, which is a single player time trial mission, and played nothing but that for a solid week, boiling down my gameplay to nothing but working on that one single interaction. And wouldn't you believe it, when that one week was over, I had learned quite a lot about how the game works on a fundamental level, and I was faster than ever before. Again, the main idea here is always to game with purpose. Whether that purpose is purely for leisure or more competitive in nature, it's important to declare in your mind what it is that you're trying to do so you can more readily focus upon it. Many of these tips are aimed at gamers whose purpose is to improve. Now, playing with no goal other than to have fun and use the gear that you want, play the way that you want to play, it's never wrong. You're not incorrect for playing that way. I'm not trying to assault or insult your playstyle, but if you're losing more matches than you're winning and you really want to be winning them, it might behoove you to start playing with a little more focused purpose. So let's move on to decision making because that is key to helping you perform better. Now, this is something that you're going to struggle with a lot, unless you go back and analyze situations that you've been in before, and start asking yourself why you made a particular choice. It's really hard to do this live, especially if you're not used to thinking about games in this way. And there's no better way to start thinking deliberately about your decision-making process than to start recording your gameplay, going back and watching it, and starting to think about it like you're actually playing. So that's where we're going to head next. Watching recordings is fundamental to optimizing your time spent versus amount learned. Thanks to Xbox, PlayStation, and any PC with a modern GPU being able to natively record gameplay without the need for external capture hardware, players across all these platforms now have a method of learning that's much more accessible to them than they might otherwise realize. Let's give some real life examples to help make the point. You could play for four hours straight and say, I want to get better at defending the flag. And so you play hard defense and capture the flag for four straight hours and maybe you learn some things, but maybe you don't. That's a lot of time to be spending on something with the pure intention of just grinding it out. But if you had a more specific goal to tackle, you could instead save some time and identify ways that you could approach the problem a little bit more intelligently. Let's try to do more with less, guys. How do we do that? Well, let's try halving our normal playtime and replacing it with watching recordings of our gameplay. You only need maybe, oh, two or three matches recorded. There's not a whole lot of sense recording everything because 
It's way too much footage to go through. You're not gonna watch through all of it, and you shouldn't. Just watch the couple of matches that you recorded, whatever you decide to pick out, and try to engross yourself in each one as if you were actually playing. You'll notice things you never noticed while playing, and make decisions in your head that sometimes agree with what you did, or sometimes disagree. You can then at that moment pause and identify which line of play might have been better. Should you have chased that guy down and tried to secure a return of the flag for your team? Should you have hidden your base and waited for your team to respawn before trying to go out and do anything? Should you have been a little bit more aggressive in your Titan, trying to build an advantage in Titan counts for your team, and would that have actually been a thing your team needed in that moment? There's a lot of potential questions, and really the list is endless, but you can identify if your thought process was good or bad in making the call that you made just by thinking through the scenario logically. Thinking logically while playing is honestly really hard and it takes a lot of inordinate amounts of practice and experience to feel so comfortable in everything that you're doing mechanically that your mind even has time to attempt thinking. It's important to note though that just because you died or lost the game doesn't necessarily mean that you made a wrong decision. Don't take every personal failure to heart. It's possible that you did everything to the best of your ability, you made the right choices, traded favorably against your opponents, but things just didn't go your way. Do your best to learn from your mistakes and identify weaknesses, but don't go overboard. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. I personally employ this technique from time to time, and it's extremely refreshing because I can instantly feel myself improving and repairing the faults that I once had as a player every single time that I do it. Learning feels good, so embrace that feeling. Let's move on to accuracy practice. Titanfall 1 and 2 are unique in their offerings for aim practice. The most played game mode in either of them, Attrition, offers both human and AI opponents to shoot. I was once given some advice by a PC player with some of the best aim in the competitive Titanfall 1 scene around. He told me that his secret was not necessarily practicing against only humans, but also practicing accurately shooting all of the grunts that are on the ground. He would challenge himself to headshot every single one of them as quickly as he could with little or no missing. He would wait for specters to wind up for one of those really big long jumps they like to do and then practice shooting them or at least tracking them through the air. Many shooting games have bots to practice with and using them wisely is very productive as a warm up. Now this isn't to say that you shouldn't employ these mindsets to killing players as well, but what you should take away is that you shouldn't take killing fodder for granted. Aiming at any target as quickly and precisely as possible is always good practice. Becoming one with your aim sensitivities, your avatar in-game becomes a true extension of your body is the eventual goal. It's just like real sports. Your golf club or baseball bat isn't just a tool, it is an extension of your body. There's lots of moving parts that you have to master, and of course, aiming in a video game is not quite as demanding or on the same level as swinging a golf club. but. Hopefully my point and my intention is well taken. Your controller or mouse deserves the same level of respect as you would give any of those other tools. As always, this loops back to that original idea that we've been talking about. It's critically important to practice with purpose. Your time is an investment, and if you invest intelligently, you're going to see bigger and faster returns than you would otherwise think possible. These concepts also transfer over to other genres of games entirely. For example, if you're a MOBA player, it's absolutely important that you learn how to properly track and predict enemy movement with certain skill shot abilities. The most salient example from my personal MOBA experience is while playing Li Ming in Heroes of the Storm. Her ultimate ability unleashes a laser in a straight line, dealing high damage per second to anyone that it touches. If you're playing against a really small character like Chromie, you're going to have a really rough time trying to deal any damage to her with any consistency unless you have really practiced your mouse accuracy. Conversely, you're going to get away with very subpar aim against big body characters like Dahaka or Anubarak without too much problem. but. It's always better to just practice that aim to improve your consistency. You always need to work on that, in my opinion. No matter what your game of choice might be, as long as there's some semblance of aim involved, I think it's very important that you try to be cognizant of your grip on either your mouse or your controller. 
Tension is the enemy of performance. You want to do everything within your power to keep things as loosey-goosey and as smooth as you possibly can. When things start getting rough, if you start digging your fingers into your controller or you start squeezing your mouse, you're going to have different muscles fighting to gain control over that mouse or over that controller, over your thumbs in particular, rather than everything working together. You're going to have different muscle groups trying to fight the bits of muscle that are used to actually aim. And that's a really, really bad thing to let happen. You're getting in your own way by squeezing on your controller or your mouse or whatever. By relaxing your grip and using more fluid movements, you open up the possibility of better accuracy and quickness with your reactions. Now it might take some time to get used to, and you're probably going to have to remind yourself to loosen your grip every now and then, but it's worth it, especially when things get hectic. I know I had troubles with this in the past, back in my very young gaming days. I would always squeeze that controller as I got frustrated or as I got into the game, and Something like this is going to really help you improve your aim as long as you're cognizant of it. Now, most people may not have a problem with this all in all reality, but it is something to be aware of and just to think about like, hey, you know, am I squeezing this thing too hard? Generally, the answer will probably be no, but for some people it might be yes. So it's just something to check out. Learning all of the maps available to you in whatever game you play is also critically important to your success. So I would suggest grabbing a few friends and heading into a private match with them. It's a surefire way to learn lots of little intricacies that you might otherwise miss out on during your normal gameplay. If you're playing a MOBA like League of Legends or Dota 2, you will be playing that same map all the time, but there's still a benefit to exploring every part of that map to see if maybe you can set yourself up for ganks, plan rotation routes, or whatever else you might deem valuable as a MOBA player. Knowing your surroundings means you can be creative with your strategies, which is extremely important if you're trying to best another player. If you're learning only by playing, you tend to be a little bit more reactive than proactive, but by doing a little deliberate practice here, you can come at the game with a plan, so that you're at least one step ahead of the competition, if not more. In first-person shooters, understanding the maps is essential to staying alive and positioning yourself well. Some games require you to also learn how to move well as a skill. Much like learning the maps or testing your weapons or whatever else you might be doing, you're going to want to go into private matches and figure out how to move well through the environment in order to maximize your gameplay. For example, Lawbreakers is a hero-based shooter that's extremely fast-paced and movement is really quite important. Taking the time to learn how to get across the map as fast and smoothly as possible with a character like Assassin, Wraith, or Titan is going to have different nuances that need practice to master. This is a lot easier to do in a private match server by yourself rather than with a team of enemies getting in your way. Now let's talk about weapons. Know your tools, do the math. If you know the numbers behind the game, it helps you to use your own playing style most effectively. In shooting games, we might learn about the sweet spot range for snipers to get a one-shot kill, or how far a shotgun's pellets might travel before they disappear and have no effect on enemies whatsoever. Spray patterns, distance damage drop-offs, there's just so much information to learn that you can apply to your own playing style. And other games might differ. Games like League of Legends, or Dota, or whatever other MOBA you might be playing, sometimes even StarCraft can be brought into this, are going to have varying mechanics, including varying damage types, which also includes strengths and weaknesses based upon whether your Vulture in StarCraft does concussive damage versus explosive damage or whatever. That will matter depending on what kind of enemy you're fighting against. There's things like critical hits. There's other mechanics involved in these games, like multipliers from items like you would buy in a MOBA. And... All sorts of different strategies, all sorts of different things in the game can make you stronger or weaker or whatever. And just spending the time to learn how they work, how they alter your character, how they alter the way you play the game and approach the game is going to be a time-consuming experience, but one that will make you a much better player once you understand it. Unless someone, of course, has done all this work for you, which is kind of the purpose of channels like mine. Studying the ins and outs of your weapons is just something that we do kind of for you. And we make it so it's not as much of a hassle. It's not so much of a grind. You can just tune in to Frothy Omen on YouTube or tune in to someone else similar to me on YouTube. And you will find all the stats and relevant information about a certain weapon or skill and how to use it to its maximum effectiveness. And that's a really, really great way to learn about the games that you play as well, is to watch other people play, listen to their experiences, listen to their opinions, and see 
what you can draw from them. Sometimes you may not agree with them, but you can still draw value from what they're saying and then just kind of malleate that into something that works for you personally. This is actually a really great segue into our next section, which is all about managing your time. Everyone has a different situation, so let's keep this pretty simple. The important thing here is that you try not to game every single day so that you can take some breaks and then come back to your games with a fresh head. The easiest version of this would be to keep your gaming to four days a week and not all back to back if possible. This is going to reduce the effects of overplaying while giving you the ideal practice time to get better at your games. As for your session times, rather than tell you how much to play or not to play, just be aware of when you get to the point that you're going through the motions or getting frustrated and not actually thinking. You're not actually playing with a purpose anymore. You're just playing to play and you're getting mad. You've probably benefited all that you can from your session by that point, so that'll probably be a good time to pack it in and just go do something else with your time. In order to increase your enjoyment or just your performance in general, you don't want to be playing the game for the sake of playing it and nothing else. You want to have some kind of purpose. Now, of course, do whatever you like, and that's fine, but if you want to test this theory to see if your gaming experience might improve a bit, then we would strongly recommend it. Playing for more than four days a week, or just really long sessions in general, are not the end of the world, so don't worry about it if you do it every now and then. It's fun to do that every now and then, but it's just that the experience is going to start to become less rewarding the more often you do this. The more often you subject your brain to that dopamine release of playing video games, the more of a tolerance you're going to build up, and the harder it's going to be to get that joy out of that, well, dopamine release. So try to limit your gaming time so that way when you do decide to play, when you do decide to flood that brain's reward center with some video games, you enjoy it a little bit more easily and a little bit more readily. Let's move on to flow states, which is our final major topic. A flow state is basically a state of intense concentration with no mental chatter. You basically stop thinking and start just doing. Have you ever heard of being in the zone? Well, that's the perfect example of what a flow state is. Like we said in part one, this is not something that you can force, but you can help to create the conditions needed in order to fall into a flow state much more readily. With practice, you might find yourself there more often, and when you're in the zone, you become capable of truly amazing things. At the same time, you're going to be enjoying the game to the maximum level that you possibly can, so what can we do to hit those flow states as often as possible? We've got three major tips for you for this final section. First is building your skill through some deliberate practice. Now, that's literally everything that we've already talked about in the video so far. So you need to try and do all of those things. You need to start putting those into practice, at least some of them, if not all of them, and get to a point where you're extremely comfortable and confident in your game because that is what is needed in order to actually reach the zone. Like as an example, if you are snowboarding for the first time ever in your life, do you think you're gonna hit the zone? If you're thrown into a chef's kitchen which, with no idea of how to cook food, are you going to ever fall into the zone? The answer is no. You're never going to reach a flow state because your level of knowledge is too low and your level of stress is too high. You need to get some mastery of what it is that you're doing to hit a flow state. That is key. That is fundamental. So do all that other stuff first and then come back to this. Second, we feel like you need to set up a goal for your session. Usually fatigue and playing on autopilot are the main enemies of feeling flow. If you want to compete, you're trying to perform at your best, so don't just go through the motions. Before you enter a game, remind yourself why you're playing this particular match and what you want to get out of that match. Set a goal for the score, or trying to learn a new weapon and understand how it feels, or leveling up something, whatever the case may be. Game with some kind of purpose so that you can up the concentration and avoid playing on autopilot. To share a personal anecdote, the sport of bowling is an example that I'm personally very familiar with when it comes to directing your practice in this way. Your goal could never be just to get more strikes or get more spares. You've got to break down the little aspects of what allows you to do that and practice those particular things. For example, how many steps do you take in your approach? Four? Five? Some other number? Is the amount of distance you cover with each step the same? Is your cadence between each step the same? Meaning, is there X amount of time between every step, or are the first few steps slower and the last few steps faster? How far are you swinging the ball back? Are you swinging it back far enough? Too far? Just right? What is just right for you? 
What is the ball speed you're trying to accomplish? And can you hit that speed consistently? Not only can you hit it consistently, are you able to make tiny adjustments to it? And the, the, the list of things goes on and on and on. I can harp on this for all day long. But the point is, if you grab a pair of lanes for two hours with the intention of improving your game and you spend that time bowling for score, chances are you're doing things really, really wrong. Now, at the risk of contradicting myself, I would like to make one small clarification. Improvement of your score is a symptom of success. In the scope of practicing, which is what we're talking about right now, you should never care about the score. Ever. I think it's valid that our ultimate goal is to improve score. I mean, that's the whole point of this, right? But our short-term goal is to improve as a player instead of caring about the score. Good scores are going to come with time. You should not care if you kill one guy and die 10 times if you're trying to focus on improving one small aspect of your play because you can kill one guy and die 10 times but still be improving your bunny hopping and improving your mobility. Like It depends on what you're doing. You should not worry so much about your score at all times. Good scores will come once you practice those mechanics and you become a better fundamental player. Now, let's try something else. Let's take that two-hour session and instead spend a 20-minute block or two working on different aspects of our play, and we'll do that every time we go to practice, so maybe two times a week if you're actually serious about the sport. Maybe not like super-duper competitive, but you're serious and you want to be the top dog in your league. That's about what you would do. I know I have done that and more than that in the past for many years. Anyways, getting back on topic here, if you take that two-hour session we mentioned and you spend 20-minute blocks working on different aspects of your play, in a month, when you're bowling for score again, you're going to be bowling better than ever. If you're a golfer and you go golfing and you practice a couple of days a week, just spend a few minutes every single time working on some particular small aspect of your play and trying to really master it, or at least improve at it. In a month, you're going to be a way better player for it. And if you just keep doing it and doing it and doing it for months and years on end, that is the way you become somebody truly special. Again, all of this stuff applies to video games just as much as it does to sports or other sorts of games. If you apply this to video games using the tools that we spoke about in the last 15-20 minutes or so, you're going to be better than ever. So if you take nothing else away from this, I want you to remember this one key point. Organized practice will improve your gameplay very quickly. So try your best to work just a few minutes in here and there, and you will see an improvement in your skill in the grand scheme of things. I guarantee it. Finally, with tip number three, this is something that only really applies, again, once you have started to accomplish everything else that we've discussed in the guide already. This final tip is about pressing the mental reset button and creating a mental reset button. So having a ritual before you play a game or before you step up to your golf ball or before you step into the batter's box is a way for you to reliably and consistently execute in the way that you're wanting. As a golfer, you're always approaching your ball in the same way and setting your club in the same way. I mean, assuming your lie is reasonable, but I mean, you know, just just let's just assume that you hit a nice a nice drive. You're in the middle of the fairway, and it's nice and flat, and everything is simple. You're gonna approach that ball in the same exact way every single time, and it's going to be a great way for you to just set your cadence. As a coach back in the day used to told me, is just set your cadence. It's absolutely critical. Again, to bring up the baseball example, as a ball player, you're going to have some kind of ritual that you perform every single time you step into that batter's box for the first time and between every single pitch as well. You're going to have something repeatable to help you reset your mental state. Now, it's totally possible for you to develop a physical trigger like this that allows you to press that mental reset button. And the best example I could ever think of is a Halo player by the name of Ogre 2. Ogre 2 is considered by many to be the best Halo player of all time, and his gameplay is instantly recognizable because it's very common when watching him to see him spin his aim in a very tight circle when he's not engaged in a fight. This was called the Ogre Twitch. When he first started doing this, it was for the mechanical benefit of recalibrating the aim reticule of the pistol in Halo 1. However, over time, it became a signature move of his that simply allowed him to keep his thumb warm and in motion when not actually fighting somebody, and more importantly, allowed him to set his cadence in his head. This simple motion was something that was easy and familiar to him that he could always go back to and repeat and rely on 
and was his equivalent of that mental reset button. So no matter what your game or sport of choice is, there's always room for you to develop something to latch onto, some sort of key that's going to help you clear your mind and just to regain some confidence. For some people, it's as simple as taking a deep breath or as tapping your foot on the ground, but with enough time and introspection, you're gonna find something that works for you. Finally, let's put it all together. You built your skills, you've got your goals in mind for your play, and you've cleared your head, allowing complete focus on the game at hand. So what does it feel like to be in the zone? Well, it's called flow because every reaction and every decision seems to flow from one to the next perfectly. It's a moment of total absorption. Time slows down like a freeze frame effect and mental and physical quickness go through the roof and the brain takes in more information per second, processing it much more deeply. Intense concentration and creativity are pantomount when you're in this state. This is a state of mind where you're making fast decisions that you're not even aware that you're making. These perfect moments aren't just about controlling your skills, they are about getting out of your own way, letting go of control and allowing your body to take over. If you've ever played a sport competitively at a high level, then chances are you've experienced this state at least once before, and it's hard to characterize just how fantastic it feels, but given enough time and practice, it's totally possible to achieve this state and be the perfect you. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that this has been at least somewhat helpful to you in some way. I appreciate that you've gone this far, this deep into the video, and you've spent over 25 minutes of your time to listen to me talk about <laughs> a lot of stuff here. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for supporting the video and supporting the channel. If you have any questions or comments, I'm please, please leave them down below. I want to read what you guys have to say about this one. I'll see you in the next one. Take care.